together, everyone has some level of problems. The guys here before my talk were asking, hey, can you check like this stuff? <laughs> right? And the first thing I did was I typed a quote and I hit return and I get these PHP errors up here. Bad search filter in LDAP search. So the first thing I see is, okay, well, I know exactly where the scripts are on this server, which is nice, right? And I know they're calling LDAP search. And then there's various things I can do with that information. Now, I need to read a little bit about how I can do an LDAP injection. I know all about SQL injections. I haven't done an LDAP in injection ever, I don't think. But I'm pretty sure since this stuff is going unfiltered into an LDAP query and I can mess up the actual search, I can probably do something evil in that LDAP search and, and maybe get other people's information out of the LDAP directory. Maybe. I don't know. I haven't really investigated it. But I can take it a step further and on this same URL, I haven't quite figured out why it looks different, but I was able to inject oops, a mouse over. So by simply putting quote on mouse over equals some JavaScript, I was able to inject an alert mouse over. So whenever I move the mouse down here, boof, it shows the cookies, right? Which just means that I can run arbitrary JavaScript. So again, on this login page, I could make this a phishing page quite easily by just injecting the right stuff. And it's SSL'd, right? It's running over SSL, it's encrypted, you can check the certificate. All that stuff doesn't matter because I'm going around that, it's an indirect attack. The other cool thing about cross-site scripting holes is that they're immune to firewalls. Now you can put all the firewalls you, front, you want in front of your company intranet. I don't care if there is somebody behind the firewall who has access to the outside world and to files behind the firewall, the firewall may as well not be there. Because if I get them to click on a link out on the web that hits something behind the firewall, their browser is going to do it. I don't need direct access. It's a proxy attack that goes via a browser. And I can do all kinds of things. I can do a port scan. I can do all kinds of interesting things once I have control of that browser. And all I need to get control of the browser is a cross-site scripting hole somewhere where I can run my JavaScript. If I can run my JavaScript in the browser, I can do stuff in the browser and make it do stuff behind the firewall. So firewalls and web security, none, zero. Okay. So what do we do about it? Now most people end up adding some filtering calls, like calling HTML special chars or various things. They sort of go through and they, they pick out places that are problematic, say, oh, I should filter this, I should filter that, maybe I should filter that over there. That just doesn't work. It's like doing network administration or putting up a network firewall and saying, maybe I should block this port, this port, and perhaps that port, but let every other port through. If you ask the networking guy that, it's like, you're, you're Silly, I mean, that's not how you do security. First, you block everything, right? Then you poke a couple of holes in your network firewall that says, okay, let port 80 through, let port 25, and maybe port 22, just those three ports, but block everything else I don't understand. For some reason, web developers don't do that. Web developers say, let everything through, and then we'll try to remember to filter data here and here. It doesn't work that way. Everyone does it that way, but it simply does not work. And hopefully by showing some holes in the stuff that you guys use, that will start to sink in. It's like you just cannot remember to filter everything yourself. So in PHP, we have a filter extension as of PHP 5.0, which was released, I don't know, seven years ago now, um, where you can turn on a default filter. Filter default equals special charge, for example. That means that all the data coming in will get filtered through the special charge filter that's characters that are special to HTML. If you want the raw data, you have to explicitly say filter input and get me the raw data. So there's a filter called filter unsafe raw. So from the post data, give me the message parameter as raw. So I want the raw stuff and it's unsafe at this point, so I shouldn't display this back to the user. What this gives you is a way to audit the applications as well. You can go through and look at an application and just check the places where they poked holes in the data firewall and then go through and say, okay, what did they do with that data? Did they just send it to a back end? Okay. Do they ever show it back to the user? Not okay. 
this is what I've been doing at Yahoo now for seven years. The first thing I did when I joined Yahoo was turn on the default filter and say, okay, we're filtering everything by default. If you want the raw data, you have to call an access function. To me, it's the only way of solving this problem. So, standard, I'll very quickly run through a few common mistakes people make. Obviously, simply not filtering post data or using an access function, getting the raw stuff and then printing it back to the user directly. Very, very simple cross-site scripting hole. Less obvious might be stuff from the server array like request URI um, or from the environment, for example, or fetching it raw if you do have a default filter, PHP self as well. Basically, this is the URL that people use to get to your page. If you're using that URL and showing it somehow for some reason, really bad idea. You, something has to filter it before you can use request URI or PHP self. Other stuff like the refer, you cannot trust it. The refer comes from the browser. You cannot trust anything that comes across the wire. I see lots of people using the refer to, like, as a back button, for example. Really bad idea. And you might ask, wait a second, but how, do, how do I control your browser and trick it into sending the wrong refer header? There we have a very nice tool called Flash, which is this very, very cool plugin that's in almost every web browser out there that has all kinds of security problems. I can make your browser do almost anything simply by making it run a Flash application. And it's really not hard to get people to click on a Flash application somewhere or just to run a Flash application. You stick it in an ad network somewhere, right, and post it as an ad to millions of sites and millions of people will run your Flash application, which has this security hack in it that'll attack your site. So it's not that hard to do. Other things that are harder to filter, this is context-oriented stuff. Imagine if the user input here, if the source input is JavaScript colon something, right? There's no quotes, there are no brackets, there are none of the things that you would normally filter. None of that's in there. It's simply you should not use this data in this particular context, right? So don't put unfiltered user data directly into a link tag like this. At least put HTTP colon in front of it or something. Um, even then, you have to be careful. IE6, the wonderful browser that it is, has this very nice feature where you can put JavaScript colon directly in the image source tag. Why? I have no idea. But if the JavaScript returns an image stream, like a bit stream for the image, it'll actually show the image correctly. So you can dynamically create images in an image source tag, which I've never seen anybody do. The only people using this feature are the hackers, the bad guys that are using it for cross-site scripting. Don't ever call any sort of decode on user data if you're doing any sort of filtering. If you're decoding behind the filter, the bad guys will figure out, well, all I have to do is base64 encode my hack. Then it'll go through the filters cleanly, and on the other side of the filter, you'll decode it for me and print it, right? Cross-site scripting hole that can't be filtered. So look for any decode calls in your code. Chances are you have a very serious problem if you're decoding user data. Attribute injections. This is what I showed with the on mouse over attack, right? I was able to add an on mouse over attribute to a tag. Um, if you don't use quotes around your things, then all I need is a space to get to the next attribute, right? So always use quotes at least. And if you're using quotes around user data, make sure you're using a filter that changes the quote to something else, like an entity. Even then, if you have any sort of on handlers, anything that runs JavaScript with user data inside, make sure that I can't modify the JavaScript. In this case, there was an on click handler where they were filtering out double quotes. So I couldn't get out of the attribute to add my own attribute, and I couldn't get out of the tag to add a script tag, but I was able to add a single quote and then add some JavaScript inside this click handler. So I was able to add this plus alert directly. So single quote plus, and then I could run my JavaScript right here as soon as they clicked on this particular link. And also be a little bit careful about using inner HTML. Inner HTML is basically an eval in JavaScript. So wherever you're getting this data from for the inner HTML, if there's some JavaScript there, it's going to get run. Right? So be very, very careful about inner HTML assignments in your JavaScript code. Now some more annoying ones. 
Um, this one was one that hit both Google and Yahoo a while back. The front end people or the JavaScript people will say, hey, this is obvious, but as a back end guy, it wasn't obvious to me at all. What happens here is that I have a little bit of JavaScript that has a single quoted string, A equals single quote, a bunch of stuff, and then the end of my single quoted string. Now, I tried to get out of this single quoted string by putting a single quote, semicolon, but I'm running a default filter very nicely, and that changes my single quote to entity 39. So my final JavaScript is A equals, single quote, a bunch of stuff, single quote, which should be fine, right? But I mouse over this, and it runs. And you look at it again going, why the hell did this alert zero run? It's inside a single quoted string. There's no other single quote here. There's an entity 39, but that's not a single quote, right? Except it is. Inside style and on handlers, entity 39 is exactly the same thing as a single quote because you basically have sort of a, a double level of eval going on here. And it's a little hard to grasp why. But the solution is to never ever use on handlers and never ever use style tags, which is bad form anyway, right? You should be attaching events after the fact on DOM ready, use a jQuery or YUI or one of these libraries to attach your events at that point. And there shouldn't be style attributes on individual tags anyway. That should be in a style sheet separate from it. Um, there's this whole accessibility thing. And there's all kinds of reasons why you should be doing it that way. You should be doing it correctly. So my advice is get rid of all on handlers, get rid of all style tags from our style attributes from your HTML, make it separate. If you have to have it, don't put any user data inside because you're not going to be able to filter it correctly. And my final one, so I'm almost out of time, um, character encodings. If you got a little bit lost up to now on all this stuff, this one is even more annoying. Um, again, our friendly browser, IE, has no idea how to handle characters correctly. Um, or at least it has a different idea than all the other browsers. What can happen here is when I inject something into the foo variable, so I assume that foo is coming from um, the user, and I can do whatever filtering I want on it. It doesn't matter. If I send percent %E0, so the hex byte E0, to the application, and that gets sent back to me, IE will see that E0, and I'm in UTF-8 mode here. And in UTF-8, E0 is the first byte of a three-byte character sequence. E0 basically says there are two more bytes coming. Now. IE sees that E0 and says, okay, there are two more bytes coming, and it takes the next two bytes and makes it part of this one UTF-8 character. In my case, I only sent the E0, nothing else, so the next two bytes is double quote slash. So now we have E0, double quote slash, is now one byte according to IE. And IE looks at that going, that's not a valid UTF-8 character, and puts a question mark. And it continues on. And the problem is it hasn't recognized that, hey, this was a double quote that was supposed to end this attribute. So it still thinks it's inside this value attribute. And it's happily reading on and on and on and on. And here's where the value attribute for this first foo tag ends. It doesn't end until here. Now, if my bar injection is on mouse over equals something, that's now going to be an injected attribute on this tag. So as soon as you mouse over, this text field, the foo text field, the JavaScript will run, which is a problem. And the, the real problem is that I filtered everything correctly. I didn't let you put a double quote in there, but I could still get out of that thing with an E0. Now, every other browser will see this E0 bracket or quote slash. That's not a valid UTF-8 character. And it sort of goes back and says, OK, well, this E0 by itself is invalid because the next bytes are not valid. And it rewinds and sees that double quote and ends the value field right here. But IE doesn't do that. And unfortunately, most people use IE. So when you're doing this stuff, you have to make sure you send valid UTF-8 out. PHP will do this automatically for you. And if you're calling HTML special chars, and you have your character encoding set to UTF-8, 
it will make sure that your output is valid UTF-8. Same with the filter extension. Most other languages and things you might use will have no idea about that. So unless you're calling some kind of icon v call or some kind of thing that validates all your output, that it's a valid UTF-8 sequence, every character is a valid UTF-8 character, you're going to have a security problem. Most sites in the world are vulnerable to this particular hack. It's a little bit hard to exploit it because you have to find adjacent places. You need a double injection. You need to first inject the E0, and then you need to find the next one where you can inject some user data there. And it's kind of hard. In this particular case, you'll notice I was very careful. I didn't have double quotes until the next value, until the next place I could inject. So there are no quotes around this one. If these were single quotes, then it would be the same problem as well. So if they were mixing double quotes and single quotes, so it's really hard to find a place where you can actually do this. But someone was able to find a place both on in Google Groups, I think, and on Yahoo Mail, the two places that people found this two years ago. Okay, I promise to leave a little bit of time for questions. Um, my slides, like I said at the beginning, are there. Show SMFO on tox.php.net. Why slow? Very useful tool for going through things. Siege, Xdebug. If you're interested in the security aspects, slackers.org, forum number three, has a bunch of gray and black hat kids that brag about the various sites that they've hacked, and it's usually very interesting. Um, I know at Yahoo we have someone who reads that forum to just make sure if Yahoo gets mentioned that we fix things right away. Um, and finally, the filter extension. You should probably read about that. Questions? I assume there'll be a few. Um, uh, it's not directly related to the security issues, but it's more related to web development. Uh, right now, we're seeing a lot of uh, web frameworks coming up, mm -hmm. Ruby on Rails, and a lot of F MVC PHP frameworks. And it's uh, kind of messy. Um, where do you see web development going from here? Do you see it more based on frameworks, more based on what you described as modular entry points? Um, what, what, what do you see the future as the, uh, the new web applications start coming up? And they need to be object oriented so people can develop them more easily. Um, right. Well, there's always this balance between convenience for the developer. And uh, so convenience and speed of development versus speed of execution. Um, it, it's, it's fine and dandy to be able to write a web application in 10 minutes by running this canned thing like Ruby on Rails that generates all your code for you. Great, perfect, but what if you didn't want to write that application? You actually needed something different. Or if the code it generates ends up being so slow that as soon as you get more than 10 users, it falls over, right? The convenience of developing a broken application comes back to bite you pretty quickly. So you need to balance these two things. You need to be able to develop an application quickly, but the application also has to work. It has to be secure and it has to be reasonably fast. And I don't think we've hit that the frameworks that we have today have not hit that balance yet, at least as far as I'm concerned. None of them are fast enough. Um, and, and think about larger sites, which means that you sort of head in, if you start using one of these frameworks, you're setting yourself up to fail because as soon as your site gets a little bit successful, it's going to fall over. And then you have to start over. And that is not the thing you want to do right when your business is starting to take off, the first thing you want to do is not to have to rewrite everything. I mean, the first thing you want to do is hire more people and do more marketing and sell more stuff, make more money. It's not go back and rewrite everything, right? So hopefully some of these frameworks will, hopefully will have less. They'll come together. Hopefully a few of them will listen a little bit more to me. I'm on the extreme end of performance. Right? I sit and I count system calls, and nobody does that. I wish more people would, but I don't expect people to be counting system calls, at least not people writing their own application code. I do expect the framework developers to count system calls, 
if you're building a framework that millions of people are going to use, you damn well better know how fast your framework is and where the bottlenecks are in your framework. And I don't think people do. And I would like to get the framework developers to my level in terms of caring about performance. Once that happens, I think things will start to change a little bit, hopefully. Where we're going to end up, I don't know. Um, I'm hoping that the framework guys come back a little bit towards performance and maybe I'll relax a little bit as well and start accepting frameworks a little bit more. But right now, I can't recommend any framework out there, honestly. No. Um, if you look around talks.php.net, you'll sh if you look at my, I did a talk at DrupalCon in Hungary last year, and you'll see it. Just go to talks.php.net and click on PHP, and you'll see my DrupalCon talk where I compared, I think, 10 different frameworks. Um, just to show the overhead of each framework for a simple application, and it's pretty drastic how slow these all are. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, it was it was very en enlightening. Some of the um, the examples you gave us the Good. on the first part. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I wonder if there is any um, any resource on the web uh, related to PHP where we can learn more on how it works. I was quite surprised, like, when you said that you actually build PHP actually builds the error message mm -hmm. and probably prepends and depends whatever is in the config before it checks if well I would say it's not not really smart but right there's no a, there's, there's, a, there's, a there's an argument to be made that we shouldn't that. build the string first but an error is always going to be an exception right and it's always going to be something that's not a normal along the normal code path and even if we sped it up a little bit it's still going to be slower than not having the error in the first place of course. Okay. My question is: <laughs> Is there any resource where we can, where we can learn more about how it works behind the scenes, and uh, mainly how it will work on version six? Because I'm like planning, planning all my right. non-framework code <laughs> into in, going into namespaces. Right. Well, and namespaces are coming in five three. Name, namespaces, namespace implementation in PHP is not recommended in your next talk. And you will be showing that, hey, get rid of all these namespace implementations because right. it does all these No, goals. core features like that that's going to be mainline are, for the most part, quick. Now, I mean, you, ha you have to take some of the things I say with a grain of salt. In this case, in my case, I wrote a really, really fast application where one error message ended up being 10% of my CPU time. In a normal application written by normal people, that one error message would not be 10% because the application would be slower. So it would be more like 1% probably in a normal application. So the impact was a bit exaggerated. But again, an error is, an, is, is sort of an, a one-off thing that shouldn't happen to begin with. For something like namespaces and other core features, obviously we're going to try our best to optimize them as much as we can. But there are things in the language that are convenience things. Autoload, for example. Autoload, like you know autoload, to autoload classes when you use them. That's completely a convenience feature that makes it sort of easier for you to manage your code. You don't have to remember what to load and when and stuff. You just let autoload figure it out. You have an autoload function that goes and finds the right place based on the, function, or the class name. Great, very, very convenient, but it does have a cost. It's much quicker if you specifically say just the, fun the classes you're going to be using in this particular request and only load those statically at the top of your file. There are various optimizations that can be done to that stuff then. So there are always going to be trade-offs. And how learning about that stuff, profiling. There isn't one page somewhere on the web. There isn't one document you can read that has all this stuff. It really is sitting down and profiling your applications and, and seeing the cost and understanding, well, the autoloader is 5% of my CPU time. It's like, I'm okay with that. I mean, yes, I could speed this up. Maybe I could make it twice as fast so it becomes 2.5%. Not a big deal in the big picture in my particular application. In someone else's application, the autoloader might be 30% of their CPU time. So in their case, they want to get rid of it, right? So that's why I try to teach a systematic approach of profiling and understanding costs. If you understand the costs, 
you start to learn a little while, after a little while, what works in your particular environment. Because you guys, I mean, you guys are SAPO. You, you're bigger than someone over there, right? I mean, they're, they're going to be smaller, and your particular worries are going to be different. So the, the hard thing about PHP is that it scales up, and it scales way, way down. Your grandmother's cookie recipe sitting in the static HTML file over here might be served up by PHP. Sapo and Yahoo are also served up by PHP. So the smallest, most trivial little page to the most traffic pages on the web are managed by the same code. And trying to recommend something for both? I was, I was surprised with the call, call user funk. Um, that call user funk is slow? Of course it's slow. Right? It's an extra level of abstraction. Every layer is going to slow you down. This is a scripting language. It's not a compiled language. On each request, we have to figure out what to do. The more layers you have to go through on the request, the slower it's going to be. Everything has a cost. And definitely the call user front stuff and front controllers, it gets very, very evil. Because the front controller has to be really heavy or it has to do a lot of auto loading because it doesn't know where it needs to go, what code to run. It has to figure that out dynamically. Whenever you have to figure out stuff dynamically that you could hard code as the other option, the dynamic version is going to be slower. Thank you. All right, others. Nice percentage. Really? Okay. You guys are being shy. Don't myself at Polish. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Bem, então vamos fazer aqui um sorteio. Vamos sortear 5 cheques de Google de AdWords e uma Nintendo DS. Agradecemos só um pouco de silêncio para isto não dar mais depressa. Oi? Ah, cá está. Ok. Sim, vai começar pelos cheques do Google. Uh, ok, só um bocadinho. Entraram por baixo, não foi? Ok. I'm sorry for giving some Google stuff at the uh, well. Primeiro é para o 2.323. Onde? Okay. O segundo é para 2.276. Não está? Então, repetir. Acho que me trigo 40 só. Obrigado. Lá está. Obrigado. <risos> Bem, mas 2.203. Vá lá, vá lá. 2.203, onde é que está? Está ali? Ok. Uh. 
Ok. Próximo. 2.263. Está ali em cima. Obrigado. 2.255. Está aí o 2.255? Está. 2.332? E a Nintendo DS vai para... 2.338. Onde está? Ah, está. Parabéns. Ah, uma salva de palmas para todos os concorrentes. Obrigado. Ah. Relembramos só que ainda temos um IPC para oferecer hoje. Obrigado. Bom, agora um, uma pequena pausa de 15 minutos para recomeçar, para recomeçar daqui a pouco.